What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from Zoom again. We are here back at the altar, and this time we are here with Enrique and Steven of Deva. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to have you all here. Yo. Yep. It's so awesome to have you guys here. Thank you for some awesome, awesome music we got. We got through Sheer Will and Black Magic. Being that this is technically the full-length uh, debut album, was this at all like kind of like a... Pulsing Dark Absorptions, was this kind of like picking up after that, the continuation of it in a way? Or was this like really just the ultimate starting point for Deva? A um, little bit of both, I'd say, probably. Um, we definitely, you know, we're picking up where we left off in the initially. And then as it, get, as it got going, we started, I don't know, just getting more ideas, started, you know, the limitations... Uh, we just started lifting the limitations a little more and just started to push what we could do technically and as far as in the songwriting apartment a bit more than we did back on that EP. So, Yeah, I think also just the way I even started playing in the band uh, with Frank too uh, kind of came out of necessity. Um, the rhythm section of this band was kind of added after the fact, after the EP was recorded just because... Um, <clears throat> Steve had worked with a very talented drummer, Justin Bean, who he played with in Trench Rock, the death metal band. And, um, you know, Dave at the time got booked to play Migration Fest, which is the 20 Buck Spin and uh, Gilead Media co-fest with all those bands. And they needed a lineup. And uh, I think at the time, Justin had already moved out of uh, Pennsylvania. So, you know, Steve and I had already been playing in Crip Sermon at the time. Frank was already in that in that mix, too. And the day just kind of came where we were talking about him needing a live lineup. And I think after, you know, countless rehearsals, it just started turning into like, okay, so like, you know, is this a band? Uh, should we keep going? And songwriting kind of started stemming from those experiences. And um, and I think that's also why um, the, I think the EP sounds one way and the album sounds another way. It's just because there's kind of more names in the hat and that kind of, conversation like that musical conversation between two people is different than the musical conversation between like four people right so um yeah once frank and i were kind of added into the bag things kind of started congealing from there and you, you get through sheer world and black magic and was there at all like a preconceived vision because it almost sounds like that deva is almost kind of in a way like a happy accident was there at all maybe like a preconceived vision of what you wanted through sheer world to sound like or was this like a very roll of the dice experimental process um, yeah, I think, I think we had a pretty good idea of how we wanted it to sound. Uh, for me personally, it just sort of was an album I was, that I just was trying to find and wanted to hear on my own time. Like I was always looking for bands and just looking for new stuff to hear. And it was in like, even the stuff I, I would like, it was like, all right, well, I like this, but I want a little bit more of this, especially like playing such a niche genre. It's usually, you know pretty meat and potatoes but i think we we wanted to do something with it was equal amount thrash as well as black metal so it had the at, the atmosphere and the attitude but with sharper songwriting and a little bit more proficiency but it had to have the atmosphere um that was a big part of it have finding the perfect middle ground between yeah being really pissed and fierce but also having the atmosphere and that was yeah, that's we strive for that mostly. Mm -hmm. Also, like I think in other interviews, I've I've specifically said how uh, this is a band. I this is the kind of band and the kind of music I've wanted to write since I was in my teens, and I'm I'm glad I did it in my thirties, just because uh, it's it's a distillation of so many things we like, and I think like musically, it's kind of daunting to look at, you know, okay, like. Celtic Frost, Morbid Angel, Sepultura, Mayhem, Dark Throne, Ar Noir, Sodom, like all those bands, like, you know, I think they're in that extreme metal world, but how do you, how do you look at those and like, what are the commonalities and when does it become like too much? Um, and, and I think for us, since we all like genuinely love heavy metal like we were diehards you know we, we, we i think we've all been in it through a million different bands throughout the years um it, it kind of became this almost like thought exercise as to how we could kind of really make it our own thing 
And one of the things I, I think is kind of cool about the record and about the band in general is like, um, I've just, I, I've been happy to see that different people have very different takeaways from it as to what they're pointing at that might be either like a similar sound or what it's reminding them of. I think that that's very interesting, even like just internally in the band there, I think there's things that Steve really hones in on that are like Steve shit, you know? Um, whereas me, I'm, I'm definitely thinking about the things I came, like I grew up with that really influenced it that might not be on Steve's page at all. And I know Frank's the same. Ed is very much the same. Um, so, so that's kind of cool to look at. Well, with this album through Sheer Will and Black Magic, I've noticed I got many different vibes from each song. Like every song had a different emotional significance. When you go from like a track like, uh, um, when you go for a track like Itch of the Battle uh, and then, you know, ending with like Luciferian Return and then you have sort of like Passion Under the Hammer, it almost seems like there's many different emotions behind it, but there's different essences of rage and really just expressing different sides. Is it fair to say that with the making of this album that there was many different emotions being felt and many different sources of inspiration and different ideas that you were bringing into it? Yeah, I'd say all the above and also just having variety as far as the album, as far as the track and the, and the track flow. Cause I don't know, I get, well, yeah, we were definitely tapping into a lot of things, but definitely as far as track flow for an album, uh, one of the things I always say is like, I view albums as one whole piece, not just a bunch of songs. So when you, you we start writing songs, it's, you know, and it starts all gelling together. We start to realize like, okay, this this is missing or like this kind of song is missing we need something more like this etc et like something like passion and then for when we wrote luciferian return it was like okay this is definitely in the song that should end the record it just felt like a closer so it's just it's just tapping into variety and getting a good album flow but yeah there we wanted to have yeah different kinds of emotions as well i'd say I think too, like I, I've always looked at being, because if you look at our metal archives, right, we've all been in very different kinds of bands before too. And like, I, I think I, I'm the kind of person who I, I definitely want there to be purpose behind what I do musically. Like, I think I should be in a certain kind of band for a very specific reason. And I think these gentlemen too kind of feel that way. So there's a very specific kind of catharsis we all wanted to feel when we listen back to the record. Because I mean, ultimately, like as a band, we want to write a record that we would want to listen to. And as we get older, I think this is for anybody, right? You try to kind of fight that feeling of getting jaded and only listening to the old shit. Like if you if you want a new record to come out and fucking blow your mind, it, it, you got to really put an effort out there. So we wanted to write that. I think another key part of why the record has these very different kinds of moments too is just, I think this was kind of a happy accident just in the sense that um, throughout the writing of the record, we changed a lot of different practice spaces. Um, we, we went from playing at a huge, like this really big open basement in, a, in an old house in West Philly that at one point or another, someone from the band lived in, uh, to a rehearsal space, which is kind of a more clinical setting where uh, you have a very certain amount of hours you can be there, you know? to uh, an entirely different kind of space where we have a little bit more freedom to spend our time in whenever we want. And I think that kind of reflects itself in the music a little bit, like our environment. Uh, th there's these moments that sound very like precise and clinical and kind of um, under a clock. Whereas there's other moments that are more free flowing, like kind of like the bigger moments in a song like Luciferian Return, right? Which is uh, um, my favorite song on that album. I think that's... <laughs> That out that song is just absolutely insane. Thank you. I, I I think I like to think of that song as like like if there's a thesis statement for what the whole record is, that song kind of encapsulates a lot of what's going on, which is cool. Um, but then there's also like the punk edge to the record, and I think that speaks to our time at this one house in West Philly where we'd be writing in the basement. Um, Ed, someone like Ed, our vocalist, he's always had like a pretty big punk edge, and his background in a band called Infernal Stronghold. Like that was kind of like a, a Philadelphia black metal band that was made up by a bunch of punks. Um, and I think that environment that we were in when we were writing a good part of that record, um, uh, that reflects that part of it too. Um, and, and I think the record's better for it. I, 
at the time, I know we were not excited about all these practice spaces changing and turning over because they presented challenges for us, literal physical obstacles. And that that but literally problem. can lead to problems like that happened with Slayer's Divine Intervention. They kept switching studios and that album ended up sounding like it was mixed with a baked potato. So like that could definitely uh, lead to, <laughs> I just had to yeah. say that, but you were saying, I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, Steve, you can take it from here. Oh, I was just going to say, mind you, this was all kind of smack dab in the middle of a pandemic and lockdown. So it's not like morale was exactly high and there was a light at the end of the tunnel for anything. So it was just, I don't know, wasn't a whole lot to be stoked about. And it was just like, we kept losing practice spaces. So it was just like, oh, it was, it was, you know, wasn't exactly the most motivating experience. Um, but, you know, we kept on truck and we got there but yeah it was it was tough for a little while for sure yeah yeah and i think there's something to be said about like trying to write a record that has all this atmosphere to it while you're trying to kind of like fight against the most fucking pragmatic issue a person could experience which is just having to change a physical space um so i like again though i think stress builds character sometimes and i think this is a definite example of it um and yeah, I mean, I, I think that kind of partially explains how we got to the end of this road with this record. And when it came to recording it too, I mean, like, I think it's what, four to five years it took us because of the pandemic and because of switching spaces. So that also means that when we got to spend time with Arthur Rizik on the like the studio side of things, we were more than ready to record this fucking thing. I mean, these oh, were songs yeah. that um, for some songs, some songs were just a few months old, but some other songs we had written three years ago that we played like every fucking day. So, you know, um, recording this was a breeze. And uh, I think that's why the record also has like this urgent sound to it, because that's literally us in the studio just being like, all right, but, like, we're here, let's fucking do it and get it done. And, you know, trying to go for it and just be done with it. and try to kind of capture that moment, you know? It, 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 it's really funny too, like how like you really sounded like you achieved your goal with the making of this album, created the album that, because when I heard Ruins of Fading Light from Crip Sermon, like I was just like, this is like, this is like Black Sabbath master, like this is like Master of Reality, like level classic album. Like that's as modern mm -hmm. of a classic album as we can get, in my personal opinion. And then, you know, you really succeeded with Through Sheer Will and Black Magic as well. like. It seems like you're able to express yourself through multiple albums and multiple styles. I mean, Enrique, you with with Crip Sermon, but as well as Ashen Cult and The Silver and so much. And Steve, your uh, history with Infiltrator and Unrest. I know you played with Horrendous uh, live for a period of time. Ha is there a method behind the madness of all your creative projects? Or does every single project and even album for that matter that you're involved with really require a different mindset? Um, yeah, I think it requires a different mindset, but it just depends. It really is just all what's motivating you at the time and what your mood is. Um, it just, just all really boils down to that. Um, it's very, and it's all very kind of a, sounds corny, but it's very visceral for me. Like I just, you know, wh whatever I'm feeling at that time, that's why it's fun to kind of do bounce back and forth and do different things. Because when you feel like the well's kind of wanting, running dry, doing one thing, it helps to pick up another and put that hat on. And then maybe some ideas are, you'll start popping out because you, you're not thinking as hard as you were. So it, it really does help to have different outlets creatively to keep you creative and keep you inspired and fresh. Yeah, you guys have the, you guys have the biggest metal archives, like uh, uh, discography, I must say. <laughs> Well, I mean, and for me too, like kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, like I, I really, you know, as, as I've gotten older and I'm not that old, let's be clear. Uh, no, uh, really like, I think through whatever we do, like there needs to be like a purpose to it. Um, whether it's the narrative of the music we're creating or just like the, 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 the actual intent behind it. Right. And what, what, what Steve and I get out of playing in Crip Sermon is not the same as what we get out of Deva. And, and for me with the silver, like, that record was about heartbreak and loss and things like that. And obviously it's not to say that the, like Deva doesn't have personal matters to discuss. It's just through a very different, far more like angry lens yeah. 
Um, and and even like you know like a song like H of the Bottle, like Ed has said before in interviews that that was about like alcohol withdrawal for him, you know, and that's that's a personal story to him. It's not my story, but I can help put music to it. You know what I mean? So the purpose of it is just very different. Well, um, you, you led me perfectly into the next question because what I wanted to, like, when it comes to, this could either apply to Dave or any project you're in, is it better if everybody in the band is in the same creative headspace and really is on the same page? Or could your different experiences and your different ideas and your different feelings actually help enhance the songwriting in a way? I'd say both. I, I'd say it's like being on the same page for the vision musically and what you guys, what we all want to do sonically, but I think personal experiences and stuff like that added into it does add variety and a bit, you know, more personal touch to everything. Yeah, I, th I think too, like, um, especially, if, I mean, anyone who's been in a band with another person for a very long time, you start kind of picking up on how people think musically so whether I'm playing with Steve in one band or whether I'm playing with Matt in the Silver or whether Steve's playing with Justin Bean in Trench Rot, right? Like if you if you keep playing and you're trying to like improvise some ideas, there's gonna be a point where both of you lock on to something at the same time. Mm -hmm. And whether that's like an instinct or just like experience or whatever, um it's cool how you get there. And I've always thought of it as like like the convening of all these different forks in the road going to the same path. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and I think that's what Steve's trying to say too. Like it, it's, it's a little bit of column A, column B with that. I think like having people from these different backgrounds help you learn different kinds of expressions that you, that maybe you didn't have. It's like learning a new color palette, right? Like how do you, how do you help someone conceptualize a different color they've never seen? Um, I think the same thing can kind of happen with music for me. Like this, playing this record was challenging in a way that playing, like let's say, the silver wasn't. And both records are they have fast drums, but it's how I play them that are just polar opposites. It's a different kind of endurance. It's a different kind of patience to get the skills to play both at a at a high level or a level that I want it to be anyway. Um, and and I think pitting yourself with different kinds of musicians that just think differently. Um, that that's a great thing that helps you become a better player i mean and, and i'm sure steve like you know in your time with horrendous when you played live with them it was like learning how to play the guitar with a different hand right it's just like a different way of like tricking your brain into understanding how they want to phrase a riff well yeah. i mean i'll make an announcement on that so just so just because a bass has a neck and four strings it's like it's not it's not a guitar with four strings <laughs> um it's a totally different instrument so and, and if i don't know if you really want to be good at bass and you treat it like a guitar with four strings eh, it's you have a lot to learn because yeah. i'm a guitar player and i was a guitarist that was playing a bass so i re i realized very quickly how fucking terrible I was at playing bass. So well, that was I think that depends on the style. Like uh, one of my personal favorite bass players is uh, Jared Smith from Archspire, and he does like hammer-ons on the bass, and he he has like a five-string bass, and he's like you know doing all this crazy stuff. And I asked him about it. And he says he was trained as a guitar player, and he's bringing this guitar technique. But that's also has to do with the technical style. With a band like Horrendous, that has like more of a traditional death metal style to it i feel like that requires more of like a specific type of bass playing but it's funny we talked about this drums and bass because this was the next question i wanted to ask being that you're both involved in the rhythm section that's the most important part of the band i don't give a shit what terrible bass player jokes people like to say all the time um but um when it comes to laying down the rhythm do you all prefer to have music present whether it will be riffs or structures already there or enrique have you ever had a whole drum pattern or steve have you ever had a whole bass pattern that maybe the band could write according to that um i think sometimes those ideas just kind of, i mean I, that kind of writing style just stems naturally like like just from conversations in our practice space so steve will just present a riff and i'll kind of have an idea of what the beat should be and i follow along or i tell steve like okay here's a cool idea for a beat and i kind of start humming what i think the guitar riff should maybe sound like behind it uh, and then it's up to him to just totally ignore me and tell me to fuck off or not but uh but no i i, I think that kind of goes back to what i was saying about like organic musicianship between two people who've been doing it for a while like sometimes we'll be able to kind of predict 
what the other person wants to do at a certain point in the song or where to take it. Um, and it kind of goes the same with like rhythmic ideas. If we're playing like something very fast, you know, when we're, when we're reaching the end of a measure, like I think Steve and I will look at each other as we're writing a song and then we'll be like, and you know, okay, like here comes the beat down part or whatever. Um, and obviously some of our songs like Passion Under the Hammer, like that song has a very specific rhythmic structure that the whole song kind of follows throughout. Like that's that stemmed from Steve's idea for the riff. Like, and uh, I I don't like writing drum parts that you could write a different drum part for that would make just as much sense for that specific riff. I like things very segmented because again, purpose, right? So uh, when I hear Passion Under the Hammer, like I cannot even remotely envision a different drum part to it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I remember that one in particular because I kind of came up with the majority of the riffing in the song and I started playing it and then you started playing along and we kept going and we were like, all right, like we just, we pretty much finished it in a go. I remember we finished that song really quickly. Yeah. And then uh, the same with polluting because that was another experience where I had, we wanted to write a song and I, I had that opening riff laying around for years um, so I played it and then I remember we just that was another one you and I we just found the momentum and we wrote it pretty much on the floor in a practice and then I went home and refined some of what I was actually going to play and we did a few little touches but we wrote that one really quickly as well that was another very organic organic songwriting process mm -hmm. with with every album that you've all created whether it would have been runes of fading light or through sheer will and black magic um you know steve you with grindcore the infiltrator ep and um enrique with you know any of the stuff that you've done with ashen cult or uh, word of roses etc like do you think that these albums could evolve over time as you evolve as artists in a way or do you prefer if every album is more or less a snapshot of who you are at that particular time I think it's always going to be a snapshot. Um, like there's things I've I've written when I look back on some of the stuff I've done. There's no way I could ever do. Even if I tried, I couldn't do it quite like I did, for better or for worse. I don't know, but it's definitely yeah, it's definitely a snapshot of where you are at that point in your life. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Also, I mean, there's some stuff I would just not care to revisit anymore. But I, like. I think that also keeps you having this like fire under your ass so that when LP2 comes, we want to figure out ways to make it what LP1 wasn't. Mm. Uh, I don't like writing the same thing twice. I don't like going to the same well. And if a band needs to die for it, then fine. You know, <laughs> like I, I don't, I, I, I know some bands can make careers out of writing the same song over and over, and I'm not going to knock that. There's also something to say about, you know, the longevity of someone's career and staying power, right? But, um, I, you know, I, I would hope that if him and I write another record together for this band, like, and I think I'm sure we will, but if and when we do, like, it's got to, it's got to evolve. It's got to be different. Um, and I think too, you know, we've been, we've been fortunate enough to receive, um, some sort of positivity from, from people out there about this record. Right. So that means that there's kind of maybe going to be a weird expectation. Uh, I don't know if we'll, if we'll understand what that expectation is. Um, hopefully we can meet whatever that expectation is, but really I know that we'll have our own expectations. And that's what's going to matter the most to us because we want to meet and supersede those. You know, like we we really um, are going to want a clear picture of like why are we doing this next record? What's it? What what's going to be bigger about it? How do we execute that? Do you look at every album though, like with that snapshot, as you know, like a self portrait in a way, like again a representation of who you are, or do you yeah. like to use music as a pure escapism, where like maybe you're portraying somebody who you couldn't mainly be in your everyday life? Uh, for me personally, it's definitely a, a, one of my faces. Like I and and I, I like that expression. Like um, Word of Roses, collectively, everybody in that band, like in the Silver, like we were going through some shit in our lives, and that record is very much an expression of that moment in time, right? Daiva, it's a very different collection of humans. Uh, we have a different um, outlook on on that kind of stuff too. 
And this is our expression of that, you know, like I, I wrote on my own personal social media, like this record is, you know, it's a little nod to that little devil you have on your shoulder. That's just, you know, making you go, you know, and it, it's, it's good to get that out too. Um, it's important to get that out sometimes. And I, I have never written a record that really did that, that expressed that. So that was important to me, you know? Um, and yeah, Steve, I don't know. Yeah, no, I, it's definitely an extension of me, but it's also at the same time, it's like me on 11, if that makes any sort of sense. It's just, it's, it's me amplified in a way that I can't really actually be in normal settings, I guess, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I guess you can say it's like how I, I don't know. I don't want to go around the block too much about that, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an amplified version of myself in a way that I just don't get to be, I think very normally or regularly. In order to get that creative energy, that creative spark, that source of inspiration, if you will, do you need to like look for it and seek it out? Do you like put yourselves in specific places or in specific moods to cultivate ideas or does inspiration for you just strike out of the blue when you least expect it? Kind of strikes. It can be hard. I mean, for me, especially, um, it can be, it can be tough because I'm, I'm very hard on myself. So sometimes when I'm trying too hard, I, you know, I'll get real, I'll get real frustrated and irritated, but then, uh, some days it'll, you know, hit me when I expect it the least. And that's when good things start to happen. But there, there are days where I do unfortunately have to really dig around and some days I find it and some days I don't, but I mean, the days I find it, thank God, because <laughs> It's uh, it, it's a tough process. I, I think for me, like um, I, I like I like narratives a lot. I think narratives are the most effective tool of communication someone can have. So um, <clears throat> when I think about what I want to do with a record or what inspires me, I, I think of a narrative that I I either personally hold or just something I I like think about and want to envision and how can I tie this record to that idea or that communication, right? So to me, this record is very much like, I know I know it's like a black thrash record and there's a really, um, there's like this overwhelming feeling of evil behind the whole record, but there's also this um, imagery I always get of just like heavy metal. And I think of combat records, live DVDs and live VHS tapes on YouTube, right? And it's like thick of the eighties and everyone's got huge hair and they're all watching Dark Angel play the Trocadero in Philadelphia and everyone there just looks like a fucking bad guy from RoboCop. Like everybody there, you don't want to fuck with those people. And every band on stage looks tough. Their sets are only like 20 minutes long. And um and, and I think about like what a what a magical time for for the genre like that was, you know? Um and and I, I always wanted this band to point to that to just kind of give people a reminder that like metal has gone through all of these different paths, right? Whether it's like super abrasive Norse core shit or grind core or like anything that you could attribute like the punk rock aspects to, or even kind of like the the more like post metal stuff where it's a little bit floofier. And there's definitely artistry to all of those things. I think those records really are compelling listens to people, right? But I think I just don't want it to be forgotten that there's like this cool, like bad guys with bad attitudes uh, flashpoint that metal once had that is just so undeniably like just fucking sick. Like that's the dumbest way to put it. But we, I think like most people who like heavy music and are just, or consider themselves outcasts or outliers, 
we all fucking loved Beavis and Butthead. We all loved Slayer. We all had our notebook and wrote band names on it, right? Yeah. Like, we're, we're all the one, like, everybody practiced drawing a fucking pentagram on a school book, right? Like, we, we've all fucking been there. I've gotten in trouble and, for that before. And, 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 like, whether you got in trouble for it or not, or whether you went off the deep end and now you're, like, a, a 35-year-old fucking Luciferian, or you're a fucking 35-year-old guy who has a bunch of punk patches on your vest right like whatever path you went down it just should never be fucking forgotten that we all had that same flashpoint where we heard like a venom record for the first time or we or we all listened to rain and blood and that fucking double bass part blew us the fuck away um and i i very much think of this record um the the very specifics aside it's like this weird love letter to to that to that flashpoint that fly, that one flashpoint where you heard a guitar solo for the first fucking time and you just went like oh fuck like this is what is this why 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 does my blood feel like it's boiling but i like it you know what i mean like well yeah. you you've succeeded with that with both i would say the runes of fading light as well as through sheer will and black magic there's something like old school but also with a lot of new school charm behind it i think you 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 didn't recreate history, but I don't even think you created history for that matter. I think you did create the future, and the future is bright, but but by bringing the darkness that is familiar, you brought darkness that is familiar but fresh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, think I I appreciate that. Am no, I actually wanted to piggyback off of what Enrique was saying too, with like all the things that you know, old bands that we've been into. Um, it's I think a lot of this record I, I get the feeling from what a lot of people have said that it's like when you listen to it it feels familiar but there's also like a little bit more rather than just you know grabbing at the low hanging fruit that everyone's been picking at for years you know you can't you know that's that's what makes it kind of hard and I was saying it when I'm when I'm writing songs it can be frustrating because you know if, if the if the fucking riff is whack, I can't I can't get past it, or if it just sounds too overly generic. So that can be the tricky part. But yeah, it's just kind of getting getting all the things that are familiar, but just having that much more, so that it's it's just more captivating and fresh sounding. Definitely, and you have both succeeded in that regard. And thank you for giving it to the people to further embrace this amazing genre with. So before we go, I want to thank you both so much for your time and for such an awesome conversation here in the night of New York City. Is there just uh, anything else with this day of a project that you would like to promote? Can we be expecting some touring or some live shows to support through Sheer Will and Black Magic? And of course, uh, anything you would like to promote with Crypt Sermon or any of the other uh, 27 projects that you're both involved in? Uh, we have a show here in Philadelphia on Friday, November 4th. It'll be our record release show, but it also uh, the record release show of Sumerlands, their Dream Killer record, and we'll be playing with Eternal Champion and Tower at Union Transfer here in Philadelphia. So come check it out. Anyone in New York, it's not far. So You guys have a great scene, might I add, too. I, I don't know if this venue is still around anymore, but I was exhibiting a, a piece of art at uh, the Booten Saddle where uh, Young Widows played. Yeah. Is that place still around? Uh, unfortunately, the physical building and the sign is still alive, but it just got bought by a group of developers who are going to turn it into more of like, I think it's like a jazz wine bar situation. So the structure itself is preserved, but unfortunately, the way it was and what it was highlighting and celebrating is going to be a little different. Time to market yourselves as a jazz band and then just uh, really surprise <laughs> the promoter. We, we, we played it. that we uh, Deva and Eternal Champion have played a show together before and it was there. Um, and that, that was a wonderful venue. Um, and yeah, I mean, just keep an eye out for, we, we do intend, like, I, I'm always, uh, and this isn't a shot at you, nothing like that, but like, I'm always really hesitant to call a band a project because for us, like, this is a band. This is a, as full time of a band as Steve and I are ever going to be in. <laughs> uh, and you know, there's going to be more shows coming. We'll announce them when, when they're ready to announce some cool stuff, some stuff in New York you know, on maybe on the sooner side, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, um, just keep an eye out. 
Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much, everybody. We are here with Deva through Sheer Will and Black Magic. Pick that up if you haven't already. It is an absolute thrasher, brutal metal masterpiece. We will see you next time on Heavy New York. Oh. Thank you, Alex.